everyone. Welcome to The Download, where we bring you discussion and analysis from a Catholic perspective. Today is Monday, September 25th, 2023. How's the week going? There's still time to mess it up or to turn it into a wonderful example of holiness. Your choice. I'm Simon Rafe here with my two co-hosts, Christine Niles and Brad Eli. The love of God. To love God is the most important thing you can do in this life and in the next. In chapter 22 of Matthew's Gospel, our Lord says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart and with thy whole soul and with thy whole mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. And the second is like to this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But like so much of scripture and so many things in life, this needs a bit of unpacking to make sure we understand it correctly. What does it mean to love God? What is involved in that? This is my favorite topic in the entire world. And you could actually probably sum up Ford Boldly as that's the whole purpose of Ford Boldly is to share the love of God. Obviously, the love of God can take on very different facets, but scripture tells us what the love of God is. Let's just read 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. And then it tells you what love is. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. It is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in the right. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So faith, hope, love, abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. And I love this passage, everybody knows this passage, but you can be the greatest, most inspirational speaker in the world. But if you have not love, your words have zero effect. And if you, if you can, you know, I, I've had times in my life where I'll listen to two different Catholic priests, maybe two different Catholic speakers. They will say the exact same words coming out of their mouth. But for one reason, one of them is more powerful. One of them is more powerful to convict your heart, uh, you know, just change souls, all of that sort of thing. And I think it has everything to do with the charity in that person, in that particular person's life or soul, the charity that's backed up, uh, that backs up those words. If I have prophetic powers, you, you, you know, you can have all sorts of the, the greatest gifts in the world. You can have a heroic martyrdom like the, the Romans of old, you know, or even suicide bomber. I'm not calling it heroic, but obviously if you don't have charity, mm -hmm. if you're doing it for self glory or out of evil, whatever, it means nothing in the eyes of God. Charity is everything. Mm -hmm. I'd like to take the hard line on this. Please do. And say love is actually meaningless today. It's so meaningful. It's so equivocal. It's so used for so many different versions mm -hmm. of what love is. And I grew up through the 70s. And every Sunday, the priest said, love, 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 and don't be a her Pharisee. He said, don't be a Pharisee. <laughs> Anything external, you're a Pharisee, okay? So the, the love there, I didn't understand love until I heard a Bishop Sheen talk one time. And he went through the different Greek forms. Yes. And that in 30 minutes, I was like dialed in. 20 minutes, I was dialed in on the whole thing. And he, he talks about uh, agape, which is this Greek form of love of God, but actually God's loving through you. And it's something you can't do on your own. You actually have to have infused agape. So God has to be beaming that into you. And if you, if you are not in union with God or you break union with God, you no longer have that. You may remember what it's like to act sort of like along those lines, but you don't have that love. So in the Latin, the caritas, and we transliterate that into charity, charity in, in the English. And it's only that love itself, which is what St. Paul was talking about when he says, if you have not agape, mm -hmm. we translate that into love, which uh, once you say, oh, that's the type of love is talking about there. Because Sheen goes on to talk about filio. In the Greek, they had this understanding of, um, well, sorry, we get Philadelphia, brotherly love, and anthropos, phil, uh, philanthropic love, mm -hmm. which you can do on your own. You can be a philanthropist. You can be uh, natural love on your own. And then we have eros, which originally in the Greek was a wonderful word, mm -hmm. which is love of beauty, virtue, strength, and all this. 
and after Freud, it did, Sheen talks about this, says it became the root of erotic. So mm -hmm. then only everything has to devolve down to the sensual. So actually, when God actually starts to love through you, he's really not trying to make you a new person. He's just trying to elevate and mm -hmm. sanctify all those natural loves. So you're not becoming a new person, but when you love, uh, when he has your, your friendships, because a certain disinterestedness in them. You're not using somebody. You're not only being friendly when they're friendly. You actually can have uh, terms like forgive and mercy and understanding and kindness. All that started to introduce into your natural heart. So he's taking your natural heart and supernaturalizing it. Mm. And also with your lust and that type of thing. You can still have a lust for chocolate <laughs> or uh, a, a sensual desire towards your spouse. But those things are always in uh, uh, with a true love for the other person. You never use them as an object of use, but a subject of love. I think it's, I think it's very interesting that you would speak about you know, eros as kind of like this desire for, uh, and this, this, this love for, um, really for created things. So you talk about beauty and strength and virtue and so forth. And uh, you know, I, I think there can be a risk among Christians of this sense of, the, this, this sense of, of puritanism and it's all got to be sackcloth and ashes and it's all got to be ugly and, and, and this kind of thing. And, and no, to, to uh, have a, a, a love, by which of course we don't mean agape, we don't mean caritas, we don't mean adoration, but we mean that you know, attachment to, that affection for, uh, things that are beautiful, that are virtuous, you know, art and literature and and, and even other people. I mean, to be able to uh, look at other people and say that these people are wonderful, to be able to even, even you know, on this very simple level, to say this person is physically beautiful. I mean, there's, and I think that the, the, there's a kind of a puritanical uh, strand within Catholicism that has been influenced by, obviously, you know, Puritan uh, Protestantism. And I think, especially in the United States, in many ways, there's this puritanical nature of it that has spoiled that. The, uh, I was working with uh, youth uh, many years ago, boys camp, and and they were going to be going into town to visit the uh, Edmonton Mall. And I wanted to, to uh, you know, they're talking about girls, all this, they're 15, 16 year old boys and stuff like that. I wanted to bring it up to a higher plane, right? So this idea that, yes, you can appreciate beauty and that type of thing. So when you see someone that's beautiful or whatever, uh, you should, you know, give thanks to God and say, well, you know, uh, nice work, God, okay? <laughs> Well, I didn't think anything about it. They came back. I didn't go to town with them that day. So other chaperones or chaperones, you know, did. I, and they came back and they said that you cannot believe that was such a great line. And I was like, what? And they're like, oh, we saw some really pretty girls coming up. And we said, wow, nice work. Uh, they got all flattered and everything like that. Thanks. That's funny. And I was like, well, I didn't mean it that way, you know. But yeah, just, there should always be a reference actually, to that. I just, I just did an episode, an interview on modesty, and we discussed this, this sort of dangerous strain of Jansenism and, and um, mm. you know, puritanical thinking in certain fringes of Catholicism. And it is dangerous because it is. It's puritanical. It's not... Catholic, um, and you know, you have to have a good attitude to a healthy mm -hmm. attitude. And I think, sort of, the more puritanical strain where they're like, Well, you have to be covered from head to toe, and if you're not covered from head to toe, then you're sinning and shame on you. You need to do this. And it's like, I think, you know, that reveals a lot more about you there and you. your personal issues yeah. and your hang ups than anything about. Well, there's, 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 there's a wonderful line that, that I've, you know, heard many times, and I actually use it in, in, in the store. We sell uh, ladies' t shirts, which are particularly cut for women. Uh, and it says, uh, on there that they are um, tight enough to show you are a woman, but loose enough to show that you are a lady, mm. uh, which I think is, is there's a wonderful, wonderful sort of thing there. But uh, talking about love and about this, this notion of, of, of what is love, you know, and of course people of a certain age will immediately respond with, baby, don't hurt me, don't hurt me no more. But Thomas Aquinas, who is probably more into what love is than Hadaway, the popular rhythm beat combo from back in the 80s and 90s. Um, Thomas Aquinas defines love as willing the good of others. And I think this is a really, this is a really good definition. So when we think about love, you, you sometimes talk about like tough love, that you may come and you may say something to somebody that is difficult for them to hear. It may upset them. It may break friendships. It may uh, cause division. It may cause problems. And, but you're saying this ultimately with a desire to help that person to will their good. And obviously the ultimate good is that the person will be in heaven with God. The person will be saved. And that's the point. That's why we talk to people and we say, hey, you need to stop doing whatever you're doing. You need, to, you need to start going to mass again, you know, just as a very simple thing. You need to start going to mass again. You need to convert to Catholicism. You need to get to confession. You need to 
you know, stop drinking so much or whatever we might say to somebody. And you're, you're willing the good of others. And in many cases, of course, people are going to be very upset to hear that. You know, we, we hear a lot today about, um, you know, this, this, this body positivity motion, uh, notion. And a lot of the time, this essentially seems to see if you see somebody who's, you know, very, very overweight, you know, obese or whatever, you're not allowed to say to them, hey, maybe if you lost some weight, you would be healthier, you would be happier, you would be better there. Um, but and obviously, people who hear that would be very offended sometimes. They'd be saying, you can't shame me. Why are you saying I'm a bad person? It's like, I'm not saying you're a bad person. I'm saying that for your own good, and as an act of love, I am saying this, you know, there in that regard. And of course, today, one can get cancelled, you know, cancelled for saying the truth about, uh, you know, gender identity and what have you. Uh, and, and certainly, that is a, an act of love, you know, saying it, and obviously saying it in a loving way, not in an attacking way, not in a way that's designed just to cause offence, but a way of just, here it is. Uh, and that itself is an act of love, even though it's an act of love that's going to end up with you being persecuted. Right. I wanted to return to this First Corinthians passage, because I think, um, you know, this passage could actually be used as an examination of conscience, perhaps before, mm -hmm. you know, at night or whatever, before you go to confession, because it really does. It's very convicting for anyone who's serious about growing in the virtue of charity. It is convicting. I mean, it says love is patient and kind. How many times have I been impatient with other people, with my children, mm -hmm. with my spouse? How many times have I been unkind? That means I'm sinning against charity when I'm that way. Jealous. Love is not jealous or boastful. How many times have I been jealous? boastful. It is not arrogant or rude. How many times have I been rude to people? In that moment, I'm sinning against charity when I'm rude. Love does not insist on its own way. Obviously, there are times you have to insist on the truth. If it's the truth of God, then you have to. But most of the times, that's not the case. Most of the time, it's just, it's this is my opinion. It's my way. I want this. I'm being willful. I'm being stubborn. Again, that's a sin against charity, according to this. Love is not irritable or resentful. How many times have I been irritable towards other people? sinning against charity, resentful, refusing to forgive, sinning against charity, all of this. I mean, I think this is, this is convicting for anyone to read. Yeah, no, it's wonderful. The, uh, we can also look at uh, love today is not really understood as sacrifice, sacrificial. So we have John 15, 13, greater love than this no man has than a man who lays down his life for his friends. So if you want to know what love is, it's actually spelled out in sacrifice, and that's a huge, huge part right there. And the biggest part of sacrifice when you get into like a religious life or studying spiritual life and that type of thing is obedience laying down your will. So John 14, 15, he talks about, if you love me, keep my commandments. How many times have we heard today from the pulpit that love is actually spelled out in obedience? I mean, it's just not, it's not part of the, the parlance today from the pulpit. And then uh, even 14, 21, Jesus uh, doubles down on this. And he says, 14, 21, he that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. And it's this union of wills is another way of talking about what love is, that union of wills. And when we're united with Christ's will and we have that union of wills, we're going to be obedient. We're going to follow. We're going to be pattern out. And also following his example in life when he's hanging on the cross. And we say, well, okay, that's what love is, is he's hanging on the cross and, and dying for us. And we are sacrificing our life for our family, our friends and coworkers and all these type of things. That's all of that, that sacrifice and obedience. I wish I would hear that from the pulpit so mm. much today. Yeah, I know that sacrifice is the, when you look on the crucifix, that is the perfect embodiment of love. And the fact that his arms are out and he's practically stripped naked, it shows he gave everything. He held nothing back, even the moment when his heart was pierced by the lance and uh, the, the water and the blood gushed forth. Mm -hmm. That was showing that our Lord shed every single drop of his blood for us, even the blood that was in his heart, he shed so that he held nothing back. And that's what true love is. Mm -hmm. It gives everything, it doesn't hold anything back. And that is, as the saints say, God has given us all, he expects all from us. And it's, it's a big demand, it is a big demand, a big ask from God, but he gave everything, he expects everything from us. We have a lifetime of that. We have a lifetime of learning how to love, and that's why he gave us a lifetime of that. And we have to look at the saints, how they did it, Christ and the scriptures and the church teaching and all that, to learn how to love. That's training, you know, that's what basic training for life mm. is, is learning how to love. And it's also growing in virtue, so you're actually growing 
in becoming more lovable because you're becoming more like Christ, more like God. So throughout your lifetime, I think there's just too many people this Protestant mentality. You know, this is the way you're born, and this is the way you end, and it's there's nothing matter. I'm just laying, you know running out the clock mm. basically here. And life is really that formation and training. So training yourself to know how to love, and then forming, becoming more. Um, putting on Christ and become, you know, putting off the old man, putting on the new, and that's a lifetime process. I think it, I think it's very interesting. You just said something there, brother. I think is actually really profound. That that it's our job, our duty, to become more lovable. Mm -hmm. You know, so so I've a phrase that I've used, you know, a lot of times is 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 I don't need you to love me. You need you to love me. That's the whole point. The the the. the you loving me doesn't really, it doesn't help my salvation uh, and so forth, but you loving me helps your salvation because you're demonstrating love. But the, the point being, just as um, a, a person could go out into the world and cause scandal, you know, a Catholic could go out and he behaves in a hypocritical manner, uh, you know, he goes out and does a whole bunch of, you know, terrible stuff and he causes scandal. It makes it harder for other people to become Catholic at that point. If you are a bit of a jerk, if you are the kind of person who is prickly and bristly and it's not easy to love you, it's not easy to love you. There's not a sort of natural connection to love. You don't inspire natural affection, which, of course, is what supernatural love is built on. If you're a bit of a jerk and you're doing this, well, okay, you're, you're not maybe causing scandal per se, but you're certainly not making it easier. You're not helping other people to love you, and they need to love you. So I think that's a really actually a very powerful thing, that certainly with all of this uh, notion of saying, you know, that certainly maybe you've got to go out and it's got to be tough love and you've got to say some things that are unpalatable, you've got to... Um, it, <laughs> there's, there's the old philosophical... Uh, example used within philosophy uh, to, to show sort of uh, a, a false uh, understanding of it, which is to say dogs have four legs, therefore everything with four legs is a dog, and that is, of course, not true. And it's like lovable actions, loving actions may cause offense, therefore if I'm causing offense, I am loving. And there yeah. seems to be a lot of that with Catholics out there to do that. It's like, no, that's, that's, that's not the case. Um, so yeah, but I think, I think making yourself lovable, not being a jerk, is well, kind of an important thing. You know, 1 Corinthians 13. If well, you're yes. rude, you're <laughs> sinning against charity. If you're arrogant, if you're irritable, if you're, I mean, our Lord prefers to speak to us and even discipline us gently rather than harshly. He preserves gen he pre prefers gentleness rather than harshness. You know, we, we know the example of Elijah with, with a storm passing by and the earthquake and all that. But God was not in any of those things. He was in the gentle whisper. He was, he was in the wind, the gentle wind. God prefers to speak to us and, and deal with us gently. He uses harshness when kind of he has no other choice and we've made it, you know, that he's, he's got to get in, he's got to do something really harsh. And I think that's important in the way that we relate to other people as well. It's better for us to prefer gentleness in the way that we relate to other people, even when we're disciplining them. If you have to bring discipline, it's better, it's more effective when it's done with gentleness and kindness and humility rather than with harshness. Mm -hmm. And the uh, first Corinthians too, at the end of it, it says, you know, faith and hope and charity, uh, the two are passing away. Faith and hope actually we don't have in heaven. Mm -hmm. We already obtain that which we believed at a distance and hope for, we also have a, you know, a right there what we, what we were striving towards. So faith and hope actually pass away and charity is the only thing that remains in heaven. So what we have actually is we're judged by God at the end of our life. How much did we love? Mm. And not at the when it's easy, but in the difficult times. And that growing in the pattern. And Sheen talks about God has this divine conceit. So we, you know, Protestants might be amazed that, you know, God loves the Blessed Virgin Mary more than he did Judas. Not that they don't, aren't both loved and were created and had destinies and everything else, but this divine conceit. God sees himself reflected more fully in the Blessed Virgin Mary. And that perfect reflection right there, he loves in her more fully because there's more to love. There's more goodness, more virtue, more all that grace there. So, of course, he's going to love more that way. And I think that even today, you know, in this age of participation trophies, mm. where everybody is, you know, on equal footing and par and everything. And, and I don't think the Protestants really realize, you know, it's just you get to heaven or not, but Catholics are talking about how saintly you were 
what choir you're in, how close are you to God for all eternity, how like God are you for all eternity, how fully do you reflect that for all eternity? And to do that, you got to go through a sacrifice this lifetime. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's, it's, this is some, you know, wonderful stuff there, obviously. The, the, love is, a priest friend of mine said, love is a transitive verb, it requires a response. You, you, you can't, it's not possible just to say, well, I love. You love what? You love who? What, what is that oriented towards? And so when we speak about um, you know, this notion of God loves some people more than others, of course, what do you mean God loves? Well, yes, because they are capable of receiving more love. You know, the, 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 uh, the, the, the Blessed Virgin is capable of receiving more love because she is the most perfect of God's creation. And so um, when she is loved, she is capable of receiving more because God's love is infinite. So she's capable of receiving far more than, than you know, the, the, the rest of us uh, poor mortals there. But there was another thing that you said, and you said this when we were on, I don't know, two, three iterations of the download ago, different table. And I, it's always stuck with me. You talked about faith, hope, and charity as theological virtues, because they are oriented towards God. But you specifically said, and this I thought was absolutely wonderful, that we could not express faith, hope, and charity unless we were in a state of grace. That, that once we were in a state of mortal sin, we kind of broken that connection, that well, ability to, still to remain. show them. Faith and yeah. hope still remain because we wouldn't be able to um, come back to God in the confessional. But you do lose charity immediately. Mm. And if you sin against faith and hope long enough, you will lose those Nerosa. But there's a mystery there. How can God still preserve that faith aspect there that we still have that spark to still get us back to, well, saying, I'm sorry, God, and I still trust in you and have confidence to go back to him in confessional and that type of thing. So faith and hope do stay alive. But when you're starting to sin against those uh, over time, you know, uh, the first commitment, they get eroded as well. But immediately charity goes to the first mortal sin. So I, I look at it as a light bulb that was hot. So there's two things going on. When God's present in you, that electricity, God, it illuminates the filament. We don't have those type of bulbs anymore, I guess, they're outlawed. No more easy bake ovens. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the filament gets, gets bright. So we have sanctifying grace, the beauty of the right. But there's also the heat of infused charity, of infused virtues. So we actually have this immediate response based on God's impulses there to, to do the right thing. When the light bulb goes off, we can still have a remembrance because that bulb is still hot, but it's out, right? But you stay away from the confessional long enough, you even lose that. It grows cold mm -hmm. in charity. So we don't even have that remembrance of the pattern of what it was like to be good. Yeah. So the, you, you were created, as we said many times, you're, you're created to love and to be loved. And to love, you need a lifetime of training. To be loved, you need a lifetime of becoming more lovable. And that's really what you're going to be judged at the end of your lifetime. Not how smart you were, not how much you did, not how many things you accomplished. All those can be related to, you know, your striving, but uh, not exactly the same thing. Yeah, and returning to, to what Scripture says about what love is, there are some people who think, oh, well, I can love God. I love God, but not love your neighbor. That's absolutely <laughs> not true. Galatians 5.14 says, for the whole law, the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then 1 John 4.21 says, in this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. And St. John also says, you make God out to be a liar if you claim I love God, but I do not love my neighbor. That is how God makes us to grow in charity. It's through loving the people that he's placed in, yeah. in your path. Yeah. Could be your spouse, could be your children, could be your colleagues, whoever, um, you know, whoever your family is, your community is, that is how you grow in love. Mm -hmm. And that means there's gonna be friction sometimes, there's gonna be irritability and resentment and hurt and things like that. You have to work through it, which is the hard part of life. You know, you just have to slog through it. But as long as you're doing what God says, forgiving, being kind, being patient, giving people the benefit of the doubt, all of that stuff, that's how you grow in love. And I think as well, you know, you talk about, you know, loving the people put in our path. Uh, well, really kind of the first person who is put in your path is yourself. <laughs> and actually to, to, to go to the quote that I read at the, at the top of the show, um, you know, the, the first and greatest commandment and the second is like to this, to love thy neighbor as thyself, not to love thy neighbor, full stop, not to love thy neighbor as you might love God, not to love thy neighbor, uh, you know, in, in a good and complete way, to love thy neighbor as thyself. And of course, what we should think about here is what does that mean if we kind of reverse it around? It's like, okay, we're supposed to love our neighbor and we're supposed to love our neighbor like we love God and completeness. We're supposed to love ourselves as we love our neighbor, which is willing the best for ourselves. 
I think there's a grave evil in today's society. I think we've touched on it and talked about it in a vague sense. This issue of, you know, people kind of hating themselves, people hating their bodies, people engaging in mutilations of their bodies, people who are not happy with who God has made them to be. You talk about you know, gender theory and all this sort of stuff. You know, in, in some of this you know, craziness there, we talk about like these uh, body dysmorphia things, the people who wish to mutilate themselves, amputate healthy limbs, the people who wish to do all this sort of stuff, even people who commit suicide, people who take drugs, people who engage in destructive behaviors, and all of these are ultimately coming from a failure of self-love. And I think there can be this sense of, you know, not understanding what self-love is. And you'd say it to a Christian, he might think, oh, well, that's very, you know, selfish, you know, to, to love one. So love myself, or oh, I'm being greedy, I'm being avaricious, I'm being lazy, I'm being slothful, you know, I'm doing whatever. And it's like, no, 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 you should take care of yourself. You should love yourself and want the best for yourself and do the best for yourself and avoid these destructive behaviors. Yeah, I think it's very important. In Genesis 127, we'll dial it in for people out there who are struggling with love of self. Uh, and in Genesis 127, it says, God uh, made man in his image and likeness. So each person made into the image and likeness of God who can think and can choose, can know and to love. Actually, that was something. And you're also made to be with God for all eternity. He made you because he loves that what you can become loves that what you are going to you know share with him for all eternity that's a you are loved first so he loves you first and you are loved but that image and likeness of god that's an amazing thing so trying to put all these other you know i'm cisgender heterosexual blah 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 all these lgbtqs and all that that's so such a low level of how you're identifying yourself there and the world is putting all of that you know taking all of that beauty of which you are the dignity of which you are and the, and the, the glory of which you're called to be a child of god and just trashing all that so it's easy to see if you're caught up in all that peer pressure and stuff that's your definition of self because that's what the world says you are it's probably hard to love yourself yeah. the, the, the reason we have this epidemic of self-loathing and self-hatred which is what that is is because we have lost all concept all understanding of our dignity is created in the image of God. Mm. We're not taught that. We can't talk about it in public schools anymore. How many families teach their children that? You can't love without mm. first knowing that God loves you. You know that Whitney Houston song that was a big hit, the greatest love I found was within myself. No, that's not the greatest love. <laughs> there, you know, you can't find love within yourself. You find it in God. And that we need to we need to restore that to our society. Yeah, absolutely. Well, some wonderful stuff there, talking about the love of God, of course, which is the most important thing in this world and in the next. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of The Download. Now, please join us as we finish in prayer, begging our ladies' intercession for our nation and our church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Salve Regina. Mater misericordiae, vita dulcedo et spes nostra salve. A te clamamus exules fili eve. A te suspiramus gementes et flentes in hac lacrimarum vale. Ea ergo advocata nostra, illos tuos misericordes oculos, ad nos converte. Et Jesum benedictum fructum ventris tui. Nobis post hoc exilium ostende, o clement sopia, o dulcis Virgo Maria. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you again for joining us for the download. Don't forget, we premiere a new episode like this every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. And of course, everything's archived on the site, so you can watch it when is most convenient for you. Go back, watch other episodes, share them with your friends, etc., etc. From all of us here at Church Militant, may God bless you.